Sharon Donnelly, in case you don't know, uh, you should. She's the Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Ireland. Uh, I've had the pleasure of speaking to Sharon a few times before. It's always been extremely interesting. I'm delighted that you've agreed to be with us. Thanks so much for having me. Lovely to be here. Delighted. Not at all. I think actually uh, the CBI has been at the forefront, I think, of thinking through some of the technological implications for financial services and for supervision. And therefore, I think, you know, Ireland has been at the forefront of attracting some of the fintech, uh, how can I say it, expansion over the last few years. So it's really interesting to have you with us. Shall I maybe start with the first question, Sean? Please, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I think actually, given, given kind of the new generation of, of fintechs that has emerged, and I think we've seen a significant acceleration of that, or the uptake during the pandemic, and I think also as the younger generations are becoming more digitally savvy, or at least active, savvy is maybe too strong a word. I mean, how have you as an integrated supervisor been looking at this? Um, and, and how do you kind of work towards integrating this digital transformation into your supervisory priorities? OK, well, thanks again uh, for having me. Lovely to be here. Um, and as I said, I've been watching some of the events, so that's been really interesting. Um, so I think, as you said yourself there, I mean, the context has obviously very much changed in terms of the evolution of the financial system um, and how it's been developing um, over the last number of years. But I suppose when we think about that, we start at the sort of highest level of our overall mission at the central bank. Um, and as you say, uh, we're integrated regulators. So we have all of the different uh, sectors and we have, um, you know, investor and consumer protection. Uh, we have financial stability. We have uh, payments oversight and so on. So we have that very broad perspective. And that, I think, goes back to our overall mission, uh, which obviously, like other central banks and regulators, is about serving the public interest. And for us, I think, is very much focused on monetary and financial stability so that consumers are protected and so that the financial system is operating in, in the best interests of consumers um, and the economy. So I think we're looking at this changing nature of the financial system, innovation and so on, in terms of the different aspects or dimension of our mandate. So what do these changes mean for financial stability? What do they mean for how financial firms operate and how we need to think about supervising them? What do they mean for how consumers are protected? Um, and I think we know now that this digital innovation and these changes are really the one of the key features of the environment um, in which we're operating. I think reflecting that, um, we had our new strategic plan published about 12 or 15 months ago. And we've called out in our strategic plan, one of our own key priorities is about being future focused. And um, so that's about the bank also adapting, understanding, um, and as you said, they're sort of moving to regulate and supervise uh, this new environment. And I suppose what we're trying to achieve in that um, is to make sure that all of the benefits that innovation brings around kind of choice, competition, and um, better options and so on for consumers and investors, that, that these benefits are really harnessed uh, but of course that the emerging risks um, are managed um, and mitigated and I suppose if you think about consumer risks I mean some of them have been touched on um, earlier on things around fair treatment suitability of products making sure customers data is protected they're getting the right information um, and, and disclosure and as you mentioned being integrated we do have all the different sectors so we're looking at banking insurance funds payment service providers and so on and I suppose we really see innovation across all of those uh, different sectors. Um, and I think someone mentioned earlier, of course, innovation doesn't really respect borders. So I think a key part of our approach is to work with European and international colleagues um, in terms of their approaches to regulation um, and supervision as well. One of the key things that's been raised with us is around engagement with innovative firms, um, you know, so maybe small startups and so on. So um, a couple of years ago, we did introduce this innovation hub uh, which is a way, I suppose, of contacting us, engaging with us, talking to us about what your firm uh, may want to do um, and how to approach that. Of course, that's very helpful, I think, for the firms. It's also very helpful for us in terms of getting intelligence about what's happening in the sector, uh, what new innovations we might see uh, kind of coming at us um, in terms of authorization and so on. And of course, you mentioned COVID, so maybe just one point about that. I mean, I think one of the key accelerations we've seen has been very much about payment firms um, and, of course, firms now interested also um, perhaps in establishing under MECA once it's introduced 
And so a lot of the more recent engagement, I would say, has been around uh, payment services providers and so on. Now, I know um, the commissioner uh, mentioned Digital Euro when she was here earlier on. So just to emphasize, I suppose, again, from that integrated viewpoint, as a central bank, we'd also be very much looking at things like developments around digital euro and, of course, maintaining our commitment to cash, recognising that many uh, consumers would still want um, access to cash, notwithstanding uh, that, of course, there are big changes that are happening uh, in the financial system. Well, th thank you very much. We're actually thinking of doing a roundtable in the near future and future of cash uh, to rem remember that that also plays a role still, even though digitalization is expanding. But I think Building on what you say, it's not just that the number of fintech companies or innovative companies is expanding, but also their business model is becoming more complex, more diverse. You mentioned Mika just now in the crypto exchange space or uh, crypto service providers, but also in the payment space. There's more complexity, there's more partnerships between regulated entities and non-regulated entities, for example. How do you look at that from an, both an authorization perspective and then a day-to-day -day supervision perspective, just dealing with that increasing complexity and just emergence of entirely new business models? Yes, yeah, so I, I think this is very much a trend uh, we have seen generally in the financial services sector in Ireland um, in the last number of years. I mean, so first of all, as, as many in the audience will know, there are a number of sort of big tech companies here in Ireland, uh, very much part of the sort of overall approach to FDI um, in Ireland. So we have a kind of long history in Ireland of tech uh, firms operating here for a number of reasons. Obviously, we're part of the EU, common law jurisdiction. Uh, we're English speaking, as well. we're obviously Irish speaking too. Um, and of course, our government has a, a big strategy around sort of fintech and so on. But I think we very much see that sort of tech and finance ecosystem uh, very much in Ireland. And I think that's part of what's contributing to, as you uh, say there, Nick, these sort of changing business models, um, which I'll come back to in a moment. Um, I would say the other thing that we've obviously seen over the last uh, number of years has been big changes in the financial landscape um, in Ireland as a result of Brexit. And um, so firms coming to Ireland uh, to obviously still be in an EU member state and looking uh, maybe to operate um, on a cross border basis. And then we have these innovations, um, as I mentioned uh, earlier on, for example, around large numbers of payment firm wanting payment firms wanting to come and base in Ireland, e-money firms, firms preparing uh, to introduce Mika. And in many cases, we have firms that are looking maybe for multiple authorizations. Uh, they're maybe looking for a MIFID authorization payments as well or, or some combination. And um, so we are seeing, I think, um, a lot of differences in terms of sort of uh, what's uh, coming at us. And again, I suppose what we're trying to achieve overall is this kind of balance of making sure that the firms, regardless of their business model, are resilient, have sustainable business model and so on, uh, but that we are not sort of unduly stymieing innovation um, on the other side. Um, and I suppose one of the reasons why we're trying to make that careful balance is we know in lots of cases, innovation is a good thing. Not all innovations are necessarily a good thing. Not all innovations are necessarily done well. So it is this balance of kind of harnessing the benefits while also uh, mitigating the risks. In terms of how we go through the authorization process, I would say, obviously the European regulatory framework um, is the kind of starting point. Many of these firms are looking to operate um, under European uh, rules. And we're trying to make sure that we have that kind of consistent basis um, with other regulators and other colleagues um, across the system. Maybe one thing to mention there, because I know we're often asked at home um, about uh, payment and e-money institutions coming to Ireland. And the EBA has recently completed a peer review on the authorizations of, of PI EMI firms. And there was you know, some information on that about different jurisdictions, in, including Ireland. And so, for example, we had the fourth highest number of applications um, across the EU, and we were sort of middle of the table in terms of how long it takes uh, to be authorised. But that report found that it takes around seven to nine months uh, to be authorised, and also that one of the key drivers in the application process um, is the poor quality of applications. So I think there are, you know, there are important messages for firms around engagement with regulators and supervisors, whether that's us um, or someone else, but also about the sort of expectations that they should have of the process in terms of how long it's going to take um, and, you know, what's going to be involved in that. I would say another key aspect of um, sort of how we engage with firms and how we look at them regardless of the type of authorization that they're, they're looking for, is around our own supervisory risk appetite. So what are the risks that a firm poses to the system overall? What are the risks that a firm uh, poses to consumers? And how are we going to see 
uh, that firm sort of mitigate or deal with um, or manage uh, those risks. Um, I would mention again the innovation hub. I think we often see firms maybe who are coming newer to the financial system. They don't have uh, maybe previous track record of being involved in a regulated sector. And so a lot of the engagement is about trying to help them understand what's expected from a regulatory and supervisory point of view, um, while also uh, making sure, I suppose, that their applications and so on can meet the kind of uh, standards that we're looking for. And of course, I think it's important to say we're not going to lower the authorization standards just because a firm is kind of coming new to us or is a new type of firm or an innovator. I would say the standards kind of remain the same, regardless of whether you're coming with a traditional business model or a more innovative approach. But what we are trying to do, I suppose, is apply the framework um, in a proportionate way. But to allow us to do that, obviously, firms have to submit kind of rigorous, well thought out um, and credible applications. I'd also say, of course, uh, the authorization process is the beginning, it's not the end. So I think lots of firms think, oh, they need to get through this process. Uh, and of course, there is an element uh, of truth in that. But of course, authorization for us is just really the beginning. It's the beginning of an ongoing uh, regulatory and supervisory relationship that we will have with the firm throughout its life um, as a regulated entity. Um, and I think we very much try to see that life cycle in our, our supervisory approach. So we try to make sure that what we're seeing in terms of supervision informs how we approach authorizations and that we're using the authorization process to get to know the firms um, that we're going to have to supervise um, later on. So it is very much, I think, about that relationship. And a good example of that, um, if there are uh, payment firms, for example, in the audience or EMI firms, We've recently published um, a Dear CEO letter to that sector, giving feedback um, on what we're seeing in terms of our ongoing supervisory work. So, for example, one of the key highlights of that were gaps in the safe application of the safeguarding framework. We've asked the firms uh, that we supervise to address that, but that will also now kind of inform the authorization process uh, for those firms as well. So I'd say kind of European level this iterative nature between authorization um, and supervision. And obviously throughout that, trying to have good communication and good engagement so that both sides, us and the firms, um, understand what's happening, where applications are at and, and how the process is going to evolve. No, I think it's, it's good that you say that. I had meant to actually mention the CEO, dear CEO letter in that context. I saw that. And you're right that ultimately it doesn't matter who you are, uh, core legislation regulation applies equally, whether it's anti-money laundering, data privacy, security, all these things obviously apply equally to big and small. And I think it's good that you point that out. The other thing I find very encouraging is, as you say, setting out your supervisory expectations early and going on a journey with an applicant even before they apply has been an experience that I've seen with you, but also in some other jurisdictions as being extremely helpful rather than waiting for an application to land on a desk and then start the dialogue. So this early process seems incredibly helpful and encouraging. And that brings me in a way to the innovation hub point you mentioned twice, because you've got your innovation hub. It's there in a way to help certain nascent players to kind of get into the system. It's kind of a sandbox type of approach, if I understand it correctly. But there's also the value of not just helping companies along the journey, it's also a way for you as a supervisor to learn about what's happening in the market and the type of customer demand that might be emerging. So how are you using the Innovation Hub both to guide potential new companies into the system, but also the learnings you take away for your own supervisory process and maybe even for the purpose of this conference into the European debate through the ESAs or SSM? So, I mean, as I say, we've had the Innovation Hub for a couple of years now, maybe three or four years. Um, it is intended to have that sort of dual purpose. So one about us being able to engage with firms and them having a point of contact in terms of, you know, what is authorization, supervision, et cetera, going to be about? What does that mean for my firm? Um, and also for us in seeing sort of some of what's coming down the track uh, type of intelligence gathering, I guess, um, on innovations and so on, particularly where you're dealing with firms that are kind of on the regulatory perimeter. You know, what are they going to be doing and how is that going to interact uh, with our regulation and supervision? Um, I think we've had about 300 different engagements over the last couple of years with firms. So firms that are already regulated and want to maybe do something different uh, with innovators and new emerging fintech firms that have never been regulated before and with other firms who are sort of involved in supporting uh, fintechs and so on. So I think it's been very helpful in that 
engagement and um, that you talked about. In fact, the point that you just made there about sort of what people expect, in fairness uh, uh, to the industry, I think we did get some feedback over the last number of years about our authorization process maybe being a little bit challenging and not really understanding uh, the time that it was taking to get through it and so on. And we did get some of that feedback through the Innovation Hub and, and other engagements we would have with industry. And we've tried to, I think, communicate more clearly and explain our expectations a bit better. So again, you see that sort of um, iterative nature. Um, we, I suppose the hub allows us to see, as I said, what's kind of coming at us. So I would say, you know, a lot of firms looking at payments, obviously very topical, and um, micro insurance, needless to say, crypto and tokenization. Um, and we also see um, a lot of firms interested in sort of supporting KYC around um, AML, CTF processes and so on. So that's sort of what we see in terms of the, the incoming, I would say more recently as well. Um, you know, in the past, we've seen maybe lots of startups and so on, maybe not so much anymore. Um, I, I think that may be related to the sort of market at the moment in terms of shifting interest rates, monetary policy, normalization and so on in terms of investor engagement. And um, so what we're seeing, I, I'd say, particularly at the moment, are maybe more mature, established firms um, who want to engage with us about how they're uh, going to kind of take forward their business. We will, in the next few weeks, publish a report on what we've seen over the last year. So for, for 2022. I think the highlights would be about a third are, are kind of payment firms, about a third are in kind of blockchain, crypto type sectors, um, and then about 10% in, in reg tech as well. So we'll have some more details on that um, in the, the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, we've also um, last year set up a new uh, industry forum um, to, again, facilitate engagement between ourselves and, and the wider industry. Um, I, I mean, this is at a kind of very high strategic level, but one of the things we will do is have a sort of sub forum within that um, on innovation. Again, a way, I suppose, for us to engage with firms, um, but also to hear uh, what's uh, coming down uh, the track. And maybe one kind of last thing to highlight which I think very much chimes with what's uh, being discussed more broadly at your conference. We do see all of this innovation, disruption, digitalization, um, and we will be looking at our own um, consumer protection code uh, this year. So this is our kind of domestic uh, framework for how firms engage with um, and treat their customers. And we're doing a, a public consultation on that. Um, and a lot of that is about this kind of changing nature of financial services for consumers. Um, and obviously the feedback we're getting through the hub and more generally on this public consultation will be quite important uh, as part of that review. It's, it's interesting uh, that you say kind of where you see the trends of the type of business models is actually very much mirroring what we discussed this morning. If, if you were to take it, it was payments, it was insurance, interestingly enough, and then cryptos is going through or digital assets seems to be going through much of the two days. So it's interesting, but also, as you say, subtech and rec tech becoming more and more important and, and the sessions around that. So it's interesting how that kind of mirrors yeah. your experience. I think we talked a bit about the opportunities, but of course, from a supervisory perspective, you wake up every day worrying about the risks. You're paid to worry about risks, and not about opportunities. Um, that makes you maybe different to sitting in the finance ministry, in, <laughs> lands in your case. So how do you look at risks in the sense that you know, how do you adapt your own supervisory processes on a day-to-day -day basis to thinking about some of these risks? And what, again, looking forward, what would you like to see changed in the regulatory space to, to kind of adapt to these risks? Is the EU covering everything you think that needs to be covered? Do you see some potential gaps? Are there areas that we, at least in the medium to long term, maybe potentially have to think about? Yeah, so I mean, first of all, I would say sort of, uh, as you say, I totally agree with you. Our job is to look at risk and, and uh, what can go wrong, of course. And, and maybe some people who are, are coming to talk to supervisors or regulators find that a little bit frustrating. But as you say, that's what we're paid to do. Uh, and we do see this very fundamental change, I suppose, in the whole nature of the system um, in terms of innovation, digitalization. And of course, that's in many cases what uh, consumers want. You know, they want more mobile, they want more app based, they want more online, um, etc. So I think it's very much the case that you know the future is here now this is not something that's kind of ahead of us this is happening it has been happening and um, for the last number of years and so to some extent I suppose we've already been adjusting to that I mean a big part of the risk assessment is obviously kind of environmental risk um, understanding more broadly what's going on in the economy what consumers want what their expectations are um, and factoring that into our sort of assessment um, of how we're going to supervise firms 
I mean, I would say that for now, there's obviously a very busy agenda already in terms of implementing new regulation around um, innovation. I think I heard Dora being mentioned uh, there earlier on. I mean, we would see Dora um, as being really quite critical, not just in terms of innovation, but obviously in terms of the changing landscape around cyber. Um, and I suppose post the global financial crisis, there was a very big focus on financial resilience. Um, but equally now, I think a very significant focus on operational resilience. Um, so I think they're very important aspects of DORA uh, that will help with that. And um, one of my colleagues will be uh, leading some of the kind of cross ESA work that's going to look on the actual implementation of DORA. So we would see that as a big uh, priority. Uh, we would see instant payments, I think, um, again, as a, a big priority, although I would have to say that here domestically in Ireland, um, you know, there are some challenges, I think, for the banks in terms of uh, implementing that. But it, generally speaking, I would say we're supportive of the direction um, of travel there. Although, as I said, we remain very supportive of cash um, and maybe that's something that we could uh, come back to um, another day. Uh, we do have uh, Mika uh, coming to us. And as I said, a lot of what we're seeing at the Innovation Hub is firms who are kind of interested in going uh, in that direction. Um, I think as the commissioner was talking about when she was here with you earlier on, you know, there are some important uh, differences to think about when you look at the crypto sector in terms of unbacked, uh, backed and the technology uh, that's uh, supporting uh, the crypto sector. And we would see those differences as, as being quite important. I think we'd still be very concerned about uh, the risks to consumers uh, from unbacked. Uh, crypto, but we will obviously be working uh, to implement Mika. So I, I'd say there's a busy agenda on sort of all of those different uh, policy fronts. I think the key challenge, as always, though, is regulators kind of keeping up with innovation as it's evolving and as it's developing. And um, so I've no doubt that even as we're implementing Mika, as we're implementing Dora, uh, you know, that there are other things happening uh, that we will have to deal with um, into the future. And there's always that kind of uh, difficult dilemma for us, I think, in, in having that agility and adaptability. Um, of course, as I said earlier, for us, a lot of the framework is set at um, European level. And um, so we will be very much focused on adapting our regulatory and supervisory approach to implement um, EU requirements. But we do also have this important dimension locally um, in terms of our consumer protection code, where we have this uh, public consultation. Um, and again, would be adapting our sort of supervisory approach once we re revise the code in terms of how it's implemented to exactly, as, as you mentioned in the question, Nick, I suppose, adjust and um, how we supervised that kind of changing risk uh, landscape. And that, of course, back goes back to our overall mission of thinking about, you know, what are the risks to financial stability? What are the risks uh, to consumers uh, and investors? And how can we make sure that they're best managed and mitigated while also kind of harnessing uh, the benefits that we can have from innovation? Sharon, thank you so much. I think a few things I take away just even from your last comments. I think you're right. On the crypto sector, it's interesting that we have quite a few different sessions looking at different subsets of digital assets, stable coins, but also the evolution of crypto assets beyond the current retail behavior to what is its medium to long-term opportunity as a financial infrastructure. So I totally get that. And yes, you mentioned politely your colleague, we, we you know, took part in a hearing yesterday organized by the ESIS and we're very encouraged that Jerry Cross from your team is leading the work on Dora. Yep. It is keeping us very busy at the moment. And I think finally, I think it's, it's a real pleasure to hear kind of a concrete example how you as an integrated supervisor are looking at this in one of the more innovative markets. And I think also how within the framework of the rules, you are looking at risk-based approaches where you can, how you adapt to the individual business models without, of course, you know, giving up on, on stability and consumer protection. That's not what we're looking for. So I think really, really uh, a big thank you. You started with Irish, so at least I can end with girl Margaret for being with us. Oh, More or less the only thing I know, but anyway, <laughs> okay. uh, that. that. Uh, thank uh -huh. you very much indeed. Well, girl Margaret, it's long.